Good morning uh, in uh, the United States, or rather in uh, Russia. Good evening. Um, this, uh, I am pleased to be able to uh, present to you uh, today. I, I do so regret the opportunity uh, lost to see the fine city of St. Petersburg. I hope I have that opportunity again in the future. I am uh, coming to you now from Champaign, Illinois, uh, a bit south of Chicago in the United States. And um, and I want to talk to you about WebAssembly and uh, WebAssembly system interface today. Um, I'll uh, be giving some introduction to these technologies, um, followed by uh, some demos. My, uh, uh, my demos will be done from the command line, so my apologies to in advance to those who prefer an IDE. Um, and uh, this is my first experience with an online-only presentation, and so I, uh, I will endeavor to do my best. I hope I am well prepared, and I hope you uh, find the presentation informative. So let us um, begin. That was uh, the uh, overview. Um, so let's talk now about WebAssembly for uh, just for, kind of from the beginning. WebAssembly is what you could call a portable assembly language. Uh, it is designed for uh, portability uh, for a virtual machine. Uh, it's designed from the beginning to be uh, safe. Uh, safety is a high design priority here. It was designed to run in web browsers. And um, it uh, is, a, is a way to responsibly or safely run tr untrusted code. Uh, WebAssembly is, uh, is an open standard. Uh, it is, uh, the work is taking place inside the W3C, the, the World Wide Web Consortium. And uh, I associate it with it being driven largely by Mozilla, but uh, uh, parties from all uh, uh, different places are participating in the effort. So WebAssembly is, is a, a new way of doing portable binary code. Switching over to, to talk about WASI, or which stands for WebAssembly System Interface. And uh, what this is, is, is the next logical step. And uh, th this is WebAssembly outside the browser. Whereas WebAssembly was originally designed to run in a browser, now there is much interest in running WebAssembly modules outside a browser. And the thing about running outside a browser is that um, the in order for the code to be able to do anything useful, it needs to have access to its environment. And so WebAssembly system interface is a specification for a set of what we could call system calls. And those system calls allow things like file I.O. and access to clocks and things like that, that uh, any program will want to have access to. It remains the case that WebAssembly is all about safely running untrusted code. And so the APIs presented by Web, WASI, uh, WebAssembly System Interface, are uh, very carefully designed to um, provide the WebAssembly module only those things that it should have access to. Um, it's worth saying here that um, the specifications for WASM and WASI, WebAssembly and WebAssembly System Interface, both specifications are uh, in active development. Um, this is a um, this is a, uh, an area that is changing rapidly, and um, it in some ways it is um, not ready for prime time. Um, I could say that WebAssembly in the browser uh, is probably considered ready today. Uh, all major browsers support WebAssembly 1.0, so um, th you'll see lots of activity in that area that is uh, that is happening and, and working well. But WebAssembly outside the browser um, is under development and really not yet mature. And so when we talk about WebAssembly outside the browser, we are talking somewhat more about potential for the future, things that um, we're looking ahead a bit. And so I just want to make that qualification. So um, one of the first questions we have about uh, WebAssembly is it, it's a compiled language. It, it's, it's, a, it's a compiled, it's a format for a compiled binary. So how do we get WebAssembly compiled? And the answer uh, today is almost everywhere. Um, it is the case that 
um, most languages have some form of uh, way of compiling to WebAssembly as uh, as an output, much as one would compile a language for an Intel or an ARM chip, um, we can compile uh, various languages to WebAssembly. This is in part uh, because the uh, LLVM project, which is the backend for a number of compilers, uh, has WebAssembly backend support uh, included now, and that makes it easier for so many languages to incorporate LLVM support, uh, incorporate WebAssembly support. Excuse me. That said. Uh, some languages have more support uh, or more mature support for WebAssembly than others. One of the ones that seems to uh, have a great deal of support is Rust. And so the uh, Rust is the language that I have been using for the uh, demos and testing for this presentation. The, uh, the second question about um, WebAssembly and WASI is once you have this, how do you run it? Well, you need an environment to run WebAssembly and WASI uh, modules. And uh, that host environment um, is going to need a couple of things. One way to do it is to uh, have an interpreter. Um, there is a project called WASM3, which appears to be just that. It is uh, not something I've used, but it, it's worth saying that uh, WebAssembly can be interpreted or it can be executed um, by translation or, or by what you would call a JIT style runtime, a just-in-time just style compiler. And the, uh, the, the two JIT style runtimes for WebAssembly that I've looked at most closely are called WASMTime and WASMR. And so I will actually be showing um, both of those during this presentation. Both of them, as I said, are simply a host environment that takes a WebAssembly module and compiles it to native code so that it can be run quickly. And uh, both of them support the early WASI specification so we can run not merely plain WASM modules, but also modules that use the WebAssembly system interface. So um, I'm going to start with a demo here. Before I switch over to the demo screen, I, I want to mention a couple of things that I'll be showing. Uh, the demo here is going to be um, of a, uh, a project called Rust Ray Tracer. I did not write this Ray Tracer code. I found it uh, as an open source project on GitHub. There is a link there to my fork of Rust Ray Tracer so that you can see the changes I have made to it, as well as the credits to the original authors. Um, you will see, if you look closely, that I have simplified things quite a bit um, for... All right, um, I had a little glitch here, uh, but Geef, can you still hear me? Let's make sure that I'm still online. Um, can, can Bagif, can you hear me? Oh, oh. Okay, good. I was a little concerned. I just wanted to be sure. Um, okay, so... Um... Oh, so anyway, um, the Rust Ray Tracer uh, fork uh, of mine link is there. As I said, I have simplified the, the code a bit for compatibility with WASI because one example of things that WASI does not support uh, is threading, or at least it, the original, the early specs for WASI do not support threading. So I took that code out and made it single threaded. Um, the second thing I'll be using, of course, as I said, is Rust. Um, Rust, uh, for anyone familiar, uh, the usual build tool with Rust is called Cargo. And uh, normally with a Rust project, you would say Cargo Build. In this case, they have this wonderful extension called Cargo WASI, <laughs> which will um, basically allow um, builds of WASI code very easily. So um, I'm using that. And then, as I said, um, WASM time and WASR are the two runtimes that I have. The links to those are there. So I am going to switch to 
my command line shell where um, I would like to uh, uh, do a little bit of do this demonstration. So uh, I've created some scripts um, uh, so that as much as possible, you won't have to actually watch me type long commands and make typing mistakes and things like that. So uh, the first script is um, is just a, a quick script to um, basically get the ray tracer WebAssembly module. And uh, I could have typed this out, but the, the basic the important command here is uh, this cargo WASI build. So what the script does is it, it just basically CDs over to my Rust ray tracer directory. It builds the file and then it copies it back to this, this directory in which I am doing my demos. And so, um, but the, the, the important line here is just cargo WASI build. And so if I run the this script. Um, it does a, a quick build. Uh, actually, to be fair, it was already built, and so that's why it was so fast. Um, and we end up with this file, raytracer.wasm, and that is the, the compiled module for the ray tracer that uh, we're wanting to use. You can see that it's about 188 kilobytes, so it's not terribly large. Um, and it's, uh, in every way, that is an executable program. It's just that now we need a way to run it. And so we're going to run this command. Um, oh, let's do wasm time. And running a WebAssembly module with wasm time or wasmer is as simple as just giving the command and the name of the module. Now this ray tracer is set up to write its uh, output to standard out. So I'm going to go ahead and redirect it to a file. And uh, so I'm going to run this ray tracer. Now I've made some changes. The other, another change I made to this ray tracer is that I, uh, I turned down its quality a bit so that I would only have to stall now for about 17 seconds during this demo instead of two minutes, because you don't want to hear me talking about nothing for two minutes. Uh, well, as it happens, it was almost 20 seconds. So. Um, that is the uh, uh, that is what happens when you run, and it has uh, let's time.ppm. So it has written out a uh, uh, a ppm file. That's a very old image format that's easy to write, um, and I'll convert it in just a second. Um, the same thing happens if you use Wasmer. You get um, you can run the uh, same WebAssembly module with Wasmer as well. And uh, once again, um, this is going to take about 16 to 17 seconds, I believe. That first time took longer than I would have thought. Now, uh, it is um, it may be interesting to note, and I should just say this, that in this case, it looks like um, the two files are not identical. And uh, part of the reason why is because this ray tracer uses random numbers. And so it doesn't generate the same um, the same answers every time you run it. Um, but the resulting image should be visually un indistinguishable to the human eye. And so uh, now we want to be able to see these images. And so um, I'm going to just briefly switch over to Windows System for Linux, where I have um, the Net PBM Toolkit installed, and what I because I want to be able to run these. Um, I want to be able to see these images, so I'm going to convert them to PNG. And net, uh, the Windows system for Linux is where I have the net PBM tools installed. So I was just going to quickly go back over there. I'm back on uh, Windows now, which, by the way, I should clarify, I'm running um, a bash shell on Windows. If this looks odd to you uh, in terms of this is not uh, cmd.exe's normal way of running, um, I'm running a git bash, actually. So it's a, it's a sort of a Unix-like environment for Windows, but I am running on Windows. And so now we have, hopefully, the ability to see the ray traced image. And so that is um, the image that came out of this ray tracer run by WebAssembly. So let's see. I believe now we want to 
uh, switch back to my slides, see if I can get that just right. Yes, all right. So that's, uh, that is the, uh, the demo of the Ray Tracer running using WASM time and WASR, the, the, the popular runtimes for WebAssembly and, um, and WASI. So let's shift now to talk a bit about the, uh, the main topic of this presentation, which is a project I call WASM to CIL. It is a, a converter that takes WebAssembly compiled code and converts it to CIL, which is the uh, assembly language for .NET. Now, CIL is, there are several ways of referring to this. It has sometimes been called MSIL. The ECMA spec, I believe, refers to it as CIL, which just stands for Common Intermediate Language. And you will also see it referred to as just IL. Uh, these are all synonyms. They mean the same thing. Um, I chose CIL as the, the nomenclature I used for this project, uh, but they're, they're all the same. The uh, GitHub link for this open source project is there on the slide. Um, I'd like to mention that um, I drew inspiration for this project from another project um, by a gentleman named Ryan Lamarski, and you will uh, you can see the GitHub reference. It's not a full link because I didn't have room, but the GitHub reference for his project is uh, there on the slide as well. Um, his project predates mine, and um, I, as I said, I drew inspiration from it. His project is uh, works a little differently. He uses the system reflection emit APIs, whereas uh, my project is more about converting the WebAssembly module to a .NET assembly on disk. And so because of that distinction, uh, I have been working in parallel. So the, uh, the basic goal of uh, WASM to CIL is to do what WASM time and WASMer do um, to provide a way of running um, WASM code and to provide an implementation of WASI so that it can execute WASI modules. But instead of being its own JIT runtime, what WASM to CIL is it does is it translates or compiles or transpiles WebAssembly instructions to CIL instructions. So you end up with a native or a .NET assembly on disk. So um, the thing to do here now is to repeat the same demo we just did, except using uh, WASM to CIL instead. So I will switch back to my shell. And I have prepared a shell script here, which I call transpile. And it, uh, the command line arguments for my project are a little tricky. So there again, I, I mean, I'll show them to you so you can see the transpile script. Uh, it's, the script simply uh, just makes sure that it gets the file names right and so forth. So if I were to just say transpile, and I'm going to give it the name of the same WebAssembly module that we did before, what it's doing now is it is converting that WebAssembly module to a .NET assembly, and the result is now called raytracer.dll. And this is the same um, thing is uh, what we had before, except now it is a uh, .NET assembly. You can see, um, ignore this raytracer.il, that's just disassembled form that my script actually uh, also indicates. But the raytracer.dll, um, you can see, is uh, right around twice the size. Um, and uh, I can't really explain why at the moment. Um, there are some cases where I have not... Um, optimized for size. Nonetheless, um, they're, uh, you know, it, it is essentially equivalent. And so now we have uh, raytracer.dll. I want to be able to try running this raytracer.dll. And I have a script to do that as well. And so if we run that script, we should get a new ppm file and it is called wasm to cil.ppm and then i'm going to just quickly do the same thing i did before switch over to wsl and 
convert the file to PNG and switch back so that we can see that we once again have the same image that we had before. So um, the one thing that is potentially interesting is that the Wasm time and Wasmer versions of this both took between 17 and 20 seconds. And um, the Wasm to CIL version takes only a little over nine seconds. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later. For now, let's not draw any conclusions from that. Um, there's uh, there are things to say about the performance difference and uh, and there are things that I'm not sure about. So let's just ignore that a bit for now. So that is the uh, that is the demo of Wasm to CIL in in its operation. Uh, what I want to do now is talk a little bit about um, how Wasm to CIL works and. Um, what uh, what challenges were involved in uh, in making it run, as well as you know what challenges lie ahead. The the, the technology is certainly not uh, complete by any means. So, um, first of all, uh, a couple of things. So, WebAssembly and CIL both have um, are, are both assembly languages, um, and they both have a textual form. And it's helpful to be able to uh, show these languages in text form as opposed to compiled binary form. And for that, we use a couple of utilities uh, that I just wanted to give mention to. Uh, for WebAssembly, the tool uh, we use is wasm to wat and it is part of the WebAssembly binary toolkit. Uh, it's developed by some of the same people who um, develop the WebAssembly specifications themselves. And uh, it basically gives us the ability, as I said, to take a WebAssembly module and show it in text form. Uh, and then for CIL, um, the uh, corresponding disassembler tool is ILDASM, and it's an old um, tool that uh, people may already be familiar with. It's been part of .NET for, for some time, and it keeps getting updated for uh, as .NET changes and evolves. So just wanted to mention that those two tools are what I'm using to uh, uh, to convert these compiled representations to text form. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, instruction sets for WebAssembly and CIL. It's worth pointing out uh, on this slide that uh, WebAssembly um, and CIL in many ways are very similar. Um, this is uh, th these similarities make the transpile step uh, easier because uh, some of the instructions are almost identical. So, for example, um, the shift left instruction in both cases is spelled SHL, and, and they work exactly the same way. There in WebAssembly, there is an i32.shl. Oh, and an i64.shl. Uh, uh, in CIL, there's just one. It's just called shl. But the the uh, functionality is exactly the same. Uh, similarly, um, add is add. Uh, both languages are stack-oriented languages. Both languages have local variables. The syntax for getting them is slightly different. But there are many many similarities between these two instruction sets. And so in the cases where they are similar like this, it's actually rather straightforward to convert one to the other. So, but not all of the cases are uh, simple. Um, so one example of a case that is not so simple uh, is this, this set of instructions where we do count leading zeros, count trailing zeros, uh, pop count, which counts the, the number of bits that are set to one. These are sort of classic um, compiler low-level instructions. And in the case of WebAssembly, these are all implemented as actual instructions. But CIL lacks instructions to do this. So in order to translate, for example, a CLZ um, instruction from WebAssembly to CIL, we have to um, translate it from one instruction into uh, a loop. It's uh, it actually, you have to write actual code. So some of these instructions took more effort than others is, um, is one way to say this. 
Um, another really big difference between um, WebAssembly and CIL is in its memory model. And so recall that WebAssembly is uh, primarily focused on the ability to safely run untrusted code. And it, it, all WebAssembly modules run in a sandbox, uh, so to speak, uh, which is a way of saying that they, they run in this um, safe environment that doesn't have full access to the world. It only has enough access that the host environment gives it. And one of the, uh, one of the most important things that you need to prevent a WebAssembly module from doing is accessing memory that it's not supposed to have access too. And so the memory model for WebAssembly is, is just very different. And uh, basically, in WebAssembly, memory is accessed using an integer offset from a memory region that was that was agreed upon between the environment and the module. And so the when the WebAssembly module is initialized, the host environment says, here is your memory region and you may not stray outside it. All of your memory accesses need to be integer offsets from the base of this region. And so it doesn't really use what we think of as, um, as traditional pointers. Uh, everything is uh, contained inside this uh, memory region. So what we will see here is that this, uh, this slide shows the uh, WebAssembly code to store an integer at location 100 of its memory region. And uh, so that's, uh, you know, in WebAssembly, this is just three instructions, load the address, load the integer, store it. When we translate that to CIL, things got a little bit trickier because we have to take that memory address and add it to a real pointer to the actual base region of memory that the module was given. And it, it, that, that, pem that memory pointer is stored somewhere. And so uh, the end result is that every memory access, be it a store or a load in WebAssembly, uh, ends up being a little more complicated in CIL uh, because of the need to add this base address to it. Um, I should also say that this slide uh, shows uh, shows things in a little bit um, oversimplified uh, form. Uh, the reality would actually be worse than this because in addition to adding the base offset, um, the implementation to be correct should do bounce checking. It should make sure that the, uh, uh, that the address given is not negative. It should make sure that the address given is not too far beyond uh, to go beyond the ed end of the memory region. And uh, this that bounds checking code is not shown here. So what starts out as a very simple memory access in WASM is going to end up being uh, quite a bit quite a bit more code in CIL because of the base offset and the need to do bounds checking. Um, finally, another very substantial difference between WebAssembly and .NET CIL is the way that it handles control flow. And so uh, to review, you know, it is very common in assembly languages to have a control flow, flow instructions, which are very low level and very uh, basic, such as in CIL, you can declare a label and then you can jump to it. And the, the jump instruction is, um, is pretty flexible. You can jump to it basically anywhere. Um, it's somewhat like a go-to really. I mean, if you think of it in higher language terms, a, a branch or jump instruction is just a go-to with a named destination. Um, WebAssembly doesn't have go-to. Um, WebAssembly uh, uses what are called structured control flow blocks. And basically they get this concept from, uh, it, compilers have a, a notion called a basic block. And a, a basic block in, in a nutshell is a sequence of instructions that don't branch. So it's a, it's a sequence of contiguous instructions that will always be executed one after the other and um, they don't branch. And so in a nutshell, every time you have a branch of some kind, you end a basic block. And one of the first things that most compiler backends do is they take your code and they 
organize it into basic blocks. They find all the branch instructions and they use those to delimit these contiguous regions or continuous sequences of instructions. WebAssembly basically lifts that basic block concept into the assembly language itself. It, it does not have a general branch or jump instruction that can go anywhere. It only allows branching in the context of a, of a structured block. Uh, specifically, WebAssembly allows these blocks to be nested, which is common. And the only branch instructions that exist are to break out of the nesting. And you can specify in a branch instruction for WebAssembly how many blocks you want to jump out of. And so uh, if you look at the slide here, you'll see th we have two blocks. Uh, the outer block, and then the loop is a block itself. And um, from inside that loop, there are three branch instructions. I might be able to just see if you can see my mouse pointer and point to them. This, So this is, uh, you know, branch if one says uh, branch out one level. So what that means is get me out of this loop and go right to the statement after the loop. And so in C sharp or in C languages like that, this would be a break instruction. It's just break out of the loop. Um, the second one here is a branch. It's a conditional branch and it branches uh, zero levels out. And all that means in a, the context of a loop is um, Go go back and run the loop again. You know, it's um, it, it's just a it's like a C C sharp or C continue statement. And then finally, this uh, branch here says branch me out two levels, and that would be uh, I haven't shown it on the slide here, but that means don't just break out of the loop, but break out of the block that contains the loop. To take me out more. And when you look at compiled WebAssembly code, you will it's very common to see. Uh, blocks that are 10 levels deep and and you'll see things like branch uh, six and that means uh, break out six levels of nesting of blocks and take me to wherever that goes so it's just as powerful as a regular um, uh, branch or jump instruction in that you can have this arbitrary nesting um, however it basically it's uh, it involves a number of things that it makes a number of illegal programs harder to express is the way to say it is because uh, it's much stricter to only allow branching to things that are part of a well-defined block structure. So this, uh, this is one of the areas where um, WebAssembly and CIL are, are quite different. And I would have to admit that uh, a substantial part of the code for WASM to CIL deals with these distinctions um, because uh, CIL is not as structured as this. So that was uh, that was some talk about uh, the WebAssembly instruction set side of WASM to CIL. Now let's talk a little bit about the WASI side of CIL, the WebAssembly system interface. And I, previously, when I talked about WASI, I uh, I didn't go into much depth. I want to say a few more things, uh, a few more details about the WebAssembly system interface and what it's about. Um, it is, as I said. Um, designed to provide APIs from a host environment to a WebAssembly module so that it can, so that the module can do things. Um, it, the WebAssembly module has access to literally nothing unless the environment uh, provides it. So for example, it can't do file or directory IO unless the environment gives it an API to call, which enables that. And uh, that is one of the components of WASI, is a set of APIs for file and directory IO. And it does, it does paths, and it allows environment variables and clocks and random number generators and uh, access to the arguments to the command. Even that, uh, the arguments that uh, or passed to a command, uh, even that is not accessible to a plain WebAssembly module because uh, it it literally gets nothing from its host environment that is not explicitly provided. Um, it, it's interesting to think for a moment about this is WebAssembly 
outside the browser. Uh, when WebAssembly is run inside the browser, it doesn't need WASI. Instead, what it gets from its host environment, which is the browser, is access to other things like uh, the uh, access to run JavaScript uh, snippets and uh, hopefully someday access to the DOM and things like that. The browser's environment is exposed to the WebAssembly module there again in extremely careful ways so that running WebAssembly modules in either context is safe, even if the uh, code comes from an untrusted source. So, um, a word or two about WebAssembly uh, system interface file I.O. Um, WASI's file I.O. APIs, and I'm going to show you one of them in a moment, again, um, are based on strict permissions from the host environment. Um, the design of the file I.O. Um, methods is uh, sort of POSIX-like. In other words, uh, there are file descriptors um, that are integers. Um, the, it's not exactly POSIX, of course, but it definitely has a very POSIX flavor uh, to the API design. Uh, you will see, uh, though, that there are some very familiar concepts, very similar concepts. So, for example, things like standard out, standard in, these descriptors are present in WASI, and as long as the host environment allows access to them, they are available. So, um, file I.O., you can think of as just a very POSIX-like API presented from the host environment to the WebAssembly module. So in the process of implementing WASI in WASM to CIL 4.NET, uh, basically uh, what we had to do was implement a set of these, um, these APIs described by WASI and implement them in C Sharp. And um, what I've shown here is the output of the WASM to Watt disassembler. Uh, what I did is I ran that on the raytracer.wasm file that I showed you earlier. And this is the section of the file that shows what calls are being imported or referenced or requested by the module from its host environment. And what the, this is saying is that this module needs eight functions from its host environment and expects them to be part of a namespace called WASI Snapshot Preview 1, and it expects them to have the names shown. Um, as I said earlier, I took that Rust ray tracer and made a number of simplifications, and I simplified it down to where it only needs these eight calls. So uh, it's I've made it very simple. <laughs> um, a, a realistic program would need far more from its environment, um, but I took out as much stuff as I could, and uh, so the process of getting that demo to run involved only implementing eight calls from WASI. WASI actually has far more system calls than this. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is an example of one of the WASI calls as implemented um, in um, WASM to CIL. The, uh, this is the, an implementation of the random.get call. Uh, random underscore get, I should say. And uh, it is basically just it gives access to getting random numbers to the WASM module. And all I've done here is um, called C sh the, the .NET random um, function um, to get some random data and return it uh, to the module. Excuse me. And so, um, this is just an example of translating from the uh, WASI API that I was given to pr provide the same functionality using a .NET API under the hood. Uh, it's worth noting that if you take a look at WASM to CIL, you will see that most of the project is written in F Sharp. Um, however, the implementation of WASI itself I did in C Sharp simply to avoid have any, having any extra dependencies so that a WASM module, when it is converted to a .NET assembly, um, has no extra dependencies. It's purely standalone. It, it should be an exact counterpart to the WASM module that it started with. So that is, uh, that is an implementation of random get. Um, this one is uh, an example of uh, what 
FD write looks like. And this is the code um, for uh, file IO for writing to a file descriptor. Now I have simplified this. The actual code is a bit more complicated. It would not fit on a slide. And so I took the important parts and uh, sort of omitted the unimportant parts so that I could just show a couple of things here on the slide. Um, basically, um, what this does is given the file descriptor, it calls this thing called get stream for file descriptor. And basically what that means is that under the hood, the WASI implementation is keeping a mapping of file descriptors, which are the POSIX WASI thing, to streams, which is the .NET uh, way of referring to a, a, you know, a stream of things from the system.io namespace. And um, so, when we want to write to a file descriptor, what we mean in .NET is we want to write to a stream. And so we look up the stream that's involved, and then for each chunk of data we've been given, we write it to the stream. And that's that's the guts of what this does. It's, it's just taking basic concepts from WASI, implementing them using .NET. Okay, so... I mean, that's that's sort of the basics of um, how the WASI stuff works. Uh, I want to come back to um, the question about performance. The, so something strange happened earlier, and that is that um, WASM time and WASMR both uh, seem to be seem to be in the same ballpark, uh, the approximately similar performance numbers for executing this ray tracer, but Wasm to CIL get on that data point looks to be around twice as fast, and uh, th that should that should make us worry uh, because um, Wasmer and Wasm time are um, more mature projects. They they have had a great deal more effort. Um, they have multiple developers on them. They are, are far more compliant with the spec, and they are focused at what they do. Um, and Wasm to CIL is just the uh, the effort of one guy, me. <laughs> it is not complete. It is not mature. I have not invested time in performance, um, and. The idea that it is twice as fast as Wasmer and Wasm time is completely unexpected. That should not be the case. Um, when I started Wasm to CIL, I started it with a goal and a, and a conjecture. And, and that conjecture was I speculated that the idea of converting a WebAssembly module to .NET should not involve a huge performance penalty. Uh, I didn't know if it would be faster. I simply believed and hoped that it would not be dramatically slower. And the only conclusion that I want to draw from the data point that we have, and it really is just one data point, is that um, the fact that WASM to CIL is not measurably slower on this one test case gives me some optimism that my conjecture was correct. Um, that said, I do not want to say, um, oh, wow, WASM to CIL is twice as fast as the two most popular runtimes. There's only one data point here. There are all kinds of reasons why this data point might be an outlier, might be incorrect. I might be running WASM time and WASMR incorrectly. Um, I, I have no idea why this one data point shows WASM to CIL being faster, but I do not expect that speed discrepancy would hold up under additional testing and scrutiny. So um, please hear me say clearly, I am not here to brag about the performance of WASM to, to CIL. I consider this uh, one data point to be um, a mystery and a confusing one. Um, the one thing I will say is, if it were to be true that um, WASM to CIL's approach um, is considerably faster uh, than WASMer and WASM time. 
if it if the speed difference that we're seeing on this one data point were to show up in other measurements, other contexts, then um, then we would need to explain why. And I uh, I have to believe at this point that the only explanation uh, that makes sense, and this is conjecture again, is that uh, the .NET Core runtime is simply very mature. Um, I, I I have to believe that uh, if there is any advantage here, it is simply the fact that Wasmer and Wasm time um, are relatively new, and by uh, Wasm to CIL's approach of taking a WebAssembly module, converting it to .NET, and then running it, is basically translating WebAssembly to a very highly optimized runtime that has had so much performance uh, attention, especially in the last few years as .NET Core has grown. Um, we're, we're translating WebAssembly to a very well done runtime and uh, any speed benefits we're getting from that have to be to the credit of uh, .NET Core, not to uh, anything that I have done. So let's uh, let's talk a little bit about um, where we might be headed in the future with these two technologies. Um, WebAssembly and, and WASI, as I said, are uh, fairly young. Uh, WebAssembly itself, uh, as I've mentioned, is uh, definitely at the point where people are using it in the browser for real things. There are production applications that are shipping on this. Microsoft has recently released Blazor, which is um, the ability to compile C Sharp to WebAssembly for running in the browser, enabling uh, enabling browser-based apps to be developed with .NET technologies. All of that rests on the foundation of basic WebAssembly and uh, serves as evidence that basic WebAssembly is here today. Um, but when we speak about WebAssembly system interface and the possibility of these things um, running ubiquitously outside the browser, that is still relatively young. But um, I, I want to say that I consider these things to have a terribly bright future. Um, I, I believe there is a potential here for um, WebAssembly to... Uh, to begin growing into a universal assembly language, especially for cases where running untrusted code safely is important. And uh, I would not be surprised if in the coming years we see a large ecosystem of packages um, that are in WebAssembly and WASI format uh, in much the same way that we see uh, we see NuGet packages on NuGet.org. And in Rust, we have crates.io. And every ecosystem nowadays uh, it tends to have a package manager where people go to get these um, commonly used and popular development libraries. And I, I believe we will see that for WebAssembly and WASI in the future. Um, and uh, and we might see that become very popular indeed. Um, which brings me to you know one question that, that uh, I get asked is why did you write this thing? Why 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 does Wasm to CIL exist? And um, the reason for that. Um, there, there are silly reasons for that. Um, one reason is just I, I wanted something to um, to work on that enabled me to uh, get a little deeper into CIL. Um, I wasn't as experienced in that as I wanted. Um, but the, the more practical reasons are, uh, first of all, if in fact the world ends up with this large ecosystem of WASM and WASI packages, uh, I believe .NET developers will want to have access to those packages. And I, I believe that uh, that is a world that .NET will want to play in as well. Um, people will want to take these packages and uh, incorporate them into their .NET apps. And WASM to CIL, uh, if it grows up and matures, would be one way to do that. Um, it is also the case that I have a, uh, I just have a great interest in compiling um, other languages for .NET. Um, it is true that nowadays um, 
.NET is very focused on C Sharp. C Sharp is the dominant language for .NET. Uh, I have nothing against C Sharp, and I don't expect that dominance to change. C Sharp is a fine language, but I'm also a fan of the C and the L in common language runtime. I like the flexibility of running other languages compiled for .NET, um, and I like the idea of being able to uh, have an alternative to p invoke um, which is in some sense what you know compiling things like c to uh, the clr um, would give us the ability to run um, lower level code as dotnet assemblies and so that was part of my motivation here as well so um, as I uh, wrap up the presentation part of this demo, uh, pre the slide part of this presentation, I should say, I want to do one further demo. And uh, the uh, the app that I'm going to demo here is called Cowsay, and it's an old utility that's been around for many years. Um, and uh, the reason I want to demo that is because uh, I want to show off this thing called WAPM, or W-A-P-M, and that stands for WebAssembly Package Manager. And Basically, the thing I just said about the future uh, where WebAssembly and WASI would have this uh, NuGet.org equivalent where uh, the collections of packages would be available for people to use, well, in some sense, in a small way, that future is here today, and it's called WebAssembly Package Manager, and it is available at wapum.io is the basically the website, and it comes from the same people who do the Wasmer red uh, runtime, and you can go to um, that website or you can use their command line tools to access. Uh, packages in their package manager and incorporate them into your apps. And so I just want to show that uh, real quick. So we're back here in my demo directory. And um, I, I have a script um, that uh, I wrote to um, retrieve the CowSay package from WAPM or WAPM. I can't decide how to pronounce that. But um, the key here is this command WAPM install CowSay. And that's the thing that goes to WAPM's package registry, grabs the CowSay package, and installs it for use. Um, the only reason I wrote the script is because uh, it installs the CowSay package deep in this hierarchy of metadata that I don't care about right now. All I really want is the CowSay.wasm file. And so uh, I wanted a script to copy it out of this hierarchy to the top level directory where we are. And I didn't want to make you watch me type that command. So I'm going to run get cowsay.sh. And wow, now we have, uh, again, a WebAssembly module called cowsay.wasm. I have no idea why this module is so large. Um, it's over a megabyte, which I find interesting. But um, we'll ignore that for now. Anyway, so now we have um, this cowsay.wasm file. And it, again, it's a WebAssembly program. And I can run it. I'm going to run, using wasm time, I'm going to run cowsay.wasm, and I'm going to have the cow say moo. And there we go. We have the classic cow say utility program. I don't remember where this originally came from, but it, it basically draws an ASCII cow that says whatever you tell it to say. And so there is cowsay.wasm saying moo, and I retrieved that wasm file from a package registry instead of compiling it myself. Now we want to do the same thing using wasm to CIL to make sure that it works with packages that came from other places. So I'm going to transpile cowsay.wasm just as I did before with the ray tracer. And now we have cowsay.dll. And so we have converted the WebAssembly module to a .NET assembly. In this case, it's similar in size. It's actually teensy bit smaller. There again, I'm not going to make anything out of that. But I'm going to go ahead and run that assembly. And again, I have a, a, a script to do that for me uh, to get the arguments right. And so I'm going to run cowsay.dll um, using this script. And the results should be 
the cow saying uh, what I hope is moo in Russian. I, I looked that up and I hope that uh, I got it right. It would be terribly embarrassing if I accidentally included a Russian uh, cuss word or something like that, but I hopefully that's moo in Russian and that's what it was intended to be. So um, again, the uh, Wasm to CIL uh, compiler has uh, taken that same cowsay.wasm, converted it to .NET, run it, and we end up with a uh, similar output. I'm going to go back to my slides. I think that was my last slide. And it was, in fact, the last slide. So um, that concludes the, uh, the presentation part of this uh, talk. And I'll, uh, I think at this point, I turn it back over to Bagif and uh, basically declare that we're ready for some Q&A if there are any questions. Uh, I might say that, uh... hello, do you hear me? Hello. Yes, I hear you now. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. And um, I must say that the performance uh, observation which you have, it's both, you know, sort of strange, but also promising. Uh, and of, of course, it's worth exploring it further. But uh, as you mentioned, probably it has something to do with maturity of uh, .NET Core. But anyway, it's quite a, quite a good sign. Uh, <laughs> I do agree. I, I I want to have hope that uh, that the, those results will show up again, and um, I want to have optimism. I just don't want to be too early on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. My first question was about uh, future of uh, Wasm and Wasm as you see it, and you you actually you you already answered it though. I probably replaced it with a ad hoc question which I got uh, when I was uh, watching uh, you. You mentioned that uh, with WAS you have a possibility of running untrusted code safely. And, uh, you know, browser security is mature. Uh, won't developers be scared with the fact that WAS actually goes outside the, the browser? So, uh, can you maybe comment a bit more about it being uh, uh, like safe, uh, big uh, trusted code safely? Um, I can say that um, we, one thing I should provide, and perhaps I can um, as a follow-up, is the the links to the information from uh, the Mozilla people about um, WASI and its place in the world in terms of running uh, untrusted code. Um, basically, we should put our trust in WASI safety in the uh, information provided by Mozilla about WASI safety. And they do an outstanding job um, giving an overview of WASI and how the, the security uh, infrastructure works. Um, I have to say it's, uh, as someone who had no involvement in its design, it is very well thought out. Um, I, I see your question. It is definitely the case that people are accustomed to the idea of trusting browser safety. They might have to, uh, there will be a learning curve involved in learning to think of um, WASI safety in the same way. But the techniques are similar and Mozilla has done a fine job uh, on their design. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, question about uh, Blazor. Uh, uh, at every .NET conference, uh, there, are, there is at least one talk about Blazor, and uh, uh, people send several abstracts, typically, uh, about Blazor, and many developers quite uh, impressed with that. Uh, but I also heard some uh, more conservative opinions saying that a good developer should uh, strive to learn JavaScript and CSS if he wants to uh, publish decent uh, user interface. So, uh, so can you see potential of Blazor for fully replacing JS CSS in a significant number of C-sharp teams? Um, I, I suppose, I, I don't know for sure that, you know, Blazor is an interesting um, technology. I, I am optimistic about Blazor. Um, I believe that, it will find its place in the world. It will find a great deal of adoption simply because of two things. One is if you are familiar with C-sharp, if you're, uh, and it's not just a matter of a person. I mean, 
um, people make investments in certain languages and those investments go across a whole team and their infrastructure. And there is a lot to be said for the benefit of a team that is adept at C-sharp being able to use that language for web development. So I find that terribly interesting. Um, it, uh, it will definitely find its place. Um, will it take over? I, I don't know. I, I, you know, my own personal leaning is uh, I often prefer to use the the lower level technology. And the fact is, C sharp is a layer on top of another set of technologies, and uh, it is always, in my opinion, beneficial to understand the layer below the one you're coding at. Um, I use the mm -hmm. analogy of cars and clocks. Uh, um, when people who know how their car works get better performance from their car because cars mm -hmm. do that. C cars, uh, but clocks are not like that. Knowing how a clock works does not help me tell time. Uh, everyone can tell time the same whether they know how a clock works or not. And, and programming is more like a car than a clock. Um, if you understand what's going on under the hood, you are usually better off. And so I hope that Blazor does not become an excuse for people to not understand browsers and the DOM and things like that. Um, the second reason I think that C Sharp and Blazor could become popular is not just about C Sharp, but because, uh, how can I say this? I'm not really a fan of JavaScript, and I think JavaScript at scale has shown to have problems. Mm -hmm. Um, but I would also like to say that the answer to that challenge may not be C sharp. It could have been TypeScript. Um, I think TypeScript is is a great evolution um, and more of a, a, a seamless change than Blazor itself. That said, Blazor, really cool stuff. I expect it to be popular. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, by the way, we have uh, more like 10 minutes plus for more questions. And uh, we have also withdraw some prizes for great questions. So if you have something, uh, just shoot your question. And uh, uh, I have uh, another one. Uh, since we're, while we're talking on the Blazor, did you try using Wasm to CIL with some Blazor C sharp to produce full circle? Like you have to start with Blazor C sharp, you convert to Wasm and then back, and then use something like Reflector to see the, the, what's different. <laughs> Uh, that's a fun idea. I have not tried that. I should. Um, I think mm -hmm. if I tried it right now, um, Wasm to CIL would not be mature enough to hold up to that challenge. Um, but mm -hmm. I, that would be something that it could aspire to. Um, that uh -huh. would be clever. I actually had somebody um, it... a few a while ago refer to uh, Wasm to CIL as the anti-Blazor. They're sort of mirror images of each other. And so it would be fun to try that. Uh -huh. uh, but when you try, if you try it, uh, try to measure performance because it would be really uh, interesting if you again get uh, something which is twice as fast as, as the original. <laughs> <laughs> that would be very surprising. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so your project is open source. Uh, I know it's, it's kind of a tough one, but it's like it's it, it's an open source, and so there is a place for room for for contribution. Uh, can you think about uh, some uh, something which you would consider like up for grabs, some some future contributions uh, in such project? Um, yeah, I, I, there is definitely room for uh, external contributions. I, I should admit that. Uh, good open source projects do um, they do things to make it easier for people to contribute. And uh, I should confess, I have not done those things. Uh, the, uh, so mm -hmm. uh, apologies in advance to someone who wants to contribute to this project. I, I haven't really paved the way. Um, that said, um, probably the easiest point to um, start a contribution would be to look at the implementation of WASI and to fill in something that I've missed. I mean, because I did not implement all of WASI. There are all kinds of little holes there. And uh, that would be an easy place easier place for somebody to get started, especially if uh, they're more of a C-sharp developer than F-sharp. Um, 
Mm -hmm. But uh, there are all kinds of other options. Um, you know, the uh, for somebody who is really uh, interested in um, in getting deep, I mean, there are areas of the WebAssembly spec that I have not implemented, such as the interfaces specification, the threading specification. There's some there's some deep stuff yet to be done, and um, there's room for others mm -hmm. to contribute to that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned uh, a alternative to platform invoke, P invoke. Uh, why? Uh, what advantages are, can be associated with replacing P invoke with uh, using CIL? Um, so, I mean, I have to confess, I have a little bit of a uh, an unusual stance on these issues because. I am the maintainer of an open source project called SQLite PCL Raw, and it's basically a .NET wrapper around the SQLite library. And uh, it's widely used. Um, a lot of people, a lot of different projects depend on it. Um, and I do a certain amount of helping people with problems that they have. And almost all of the problems that people have involve difficulties in some strange case where it can't find the native library. SQLite is a is a mm. native code library. It's written in C, and um, I you know I've handled all the main cases, but I, I think every week somebody comes to me with an oddball case that I never thought of, where finding that native code library using p invoke isn't quite working right and uh, i often think you know if i had the ability to compile c to um to .NET code and have all the same apis then those problems would just disappear because .NET's ability to reference assemblies is just simpler for deployment than uh, referencing native code. That's not to say, I mean, obviously .NET has great facilities to um, reference native code, but sometimes you have to think about how to do that. Whereas uh, referencing an assembly typically doesn't require the developer to think at all, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, that's understood. Um, now about uh, the language you used to implement uh, your project. I was very pleased to uh, find out that it was F sharp. Uh, I didn't expect that. Uh, and but uh, I'm F sharp has become main uh, language for myself. Uh, so why F sharp? And could it be C sharp? And now that uh, you have written so many lines of code, how do you evaluate your experience of using F sharp for this project? Um, I would, I mean, I would say the, the basic reason why F sharp is simply, uh, my own preference. Um, I, um, I consider myself an F sharp fan at the same time. I do regularly use F sharp and C sharp both. Um, I, um, I in general prefer F sharp. I think it's a stronger language. Um, I like the stricter type checking. I like the the more the less verbose syntax. Um, I even use F sharp when I'm doing uh, non-functional programming, <laughs> um, which I, I know is heresy to some F sharp people. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I think F sharp is a is a pretty fine object oriented language too. It, you know, in some ways, and so. Um, I, I chose F sharp simply because I like it, um, and uh, but uh, you know could the project have been done in C sharp? Absolutely. You know, it, there's no reason why not. Um, I uh, I will say that you know if I were to stray into criticisms of C sharp, it would simply be having spent time in F sharp and Rust. I really find it hard to live without discriminated unions. I, I, I just, mm -hmm. um, I really wish C sharp had that feature. And I know that C sharp has been gradually gaining features from F sharp. But if there was one thing, one thing from F sharp and Rust that I miss, um, it is discriminated unions. And I, I look forward to the day when C sharp has them because uh, they they make things so much uh, easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. Uh, except probably I, I, I couldn't say that I'm really looking forward for that because I'm sort of my conversion to F sharp is probably final. <laughs> 
which is fine. I, you know, in some sense, I envy yeah. you, but I, uh, I still live in both worlds. Yeah. Okay, well, I guess we, we, uh, we all are. Okay, I don't see more questions here. So, uh, and yeah, we still have a few more minutes, but uh, I think uh, we, uh, I want to thank you, Eric, for being with us, uh, for actually clarifying a lot of things about WASM, about its internals, about uh, Wazy. And I really wish that you have an opportunity to come to either St. Petersburg or Moscow uh, later when uh, the whole world becomes less crazy and we can uh, travel again, see each other uh, uh, and talk to each other at uh, closer places, not just virtually. Indeed, I, uh, I do very much hope that I get the chance to visit St. Petersburg. Um, it, uh, I was looking forward to it. The plans were coming together and then all of a sudden this virus happened and then the world changed and that's unfortunate, but uh, I hope I have my opportunity. I did get my visa, so I uh, it may oh. still uh, be able to happen. Um, Vagif, I, I want to say thanks to you for uh, uh, serving here as moderator of this talk. I appreciated your questions and your guidance here. And thank you for all organizers and for all everyone who watched this talk and have a nice the rest of the conference.